It's weird to think that the Legend of Zelda series has been around since before most of us at Team Triple Jump were born. No shade intended, Philip, we value your life experience. But as a result, it's almost impossible to imagine the video game landscape without it, unless you're Philip, because he's old. When it was released in 1986, The Legend of Zelda exploded in popularity, and ever since, the series has spawned games of exceptional quality every few years, keeping players hooked on the comings and goings of Link, Princess Zelda, and Ganon. When you've got no fewer than 18 canonical games in your series, however, it's almost assured that there are some secrets lurking behind the scenes that are just asking to be uncovered. As always with these kinds of lists, when we say things you don't know, we're obviously talking in a general sense. I know you Zelda super fans are out there, I see you, and I appreciate you. But respectfully, back off! Anyway, I'm Ben from Triple Jump, and here are 10 things you didn't know about the Legend of Zelda series. Number 10. The Hyrule Fantasy have you ever stopped for a moment to think about The Legend of Zelda as the title for the series? Because when you do think about it, it doesn't really make much sense. After all, the protagonist is Link. Zelda is a secondary character, albeit an important one. It'd be like if Sonic the Hedgehog series were called Amy Rose Adventures. Actually, I'd quite. Can we make that fleet, Sega? Well, it turns out that originally, the developers intended for the first game to be called The Hyrule Fantasy The Legend of Zelda, and the Hyrule Fantasy part would have carried over to any sequels. When the game made it to America, however, the Hyrule Fantasy was dropped, and the game was simply titled The Legend of Zelda. The developers of the original game, Shigeru Miyamoto, Takeshi Tezuka, and Koji Kondo, were asked during an interview for the official Nintendo website why the Hyrule Fantasy ended up being dropped, but none of them was really sure. Miyamoto theorized that The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past already had a subtitle, so tacking on The Hyrule Fantasy would have made it too long. He also joked that it might have been to do with the Final Fantasy series and them not wanting to look like copycats. Number 9. The Almost Million Dollar Cartridge It's no secret that retro game cartridges can be big money, but it turns out that if you have an unopened copy of The Legend of Zelda that's in near-perfect condition, you could be sitting on a small fortune. On Friday the 9th of July 2021, Heritage Auctions of Dallas, Texas sold a rare, sealed copy of the OG Zelda title for an eye-watering sum of $870,000. The version in question, No Rev A Round SOQ, if you're wondering, was only produced for a few months in 1987 before being replaced by the Rev A variant. According to the auction house, the copy that sold was the earliest sealed copy one could realistically hope to obtain. Rats. I suppose that means I'm not likely to find one in CEX then. Thanks to the ridiculous sum paid for the cartridge, it became the most expensive video game in history, shattering the previous record, a sealed copy of Super Mario Bros. by over $200,000. Clearly, Mario isn't one to be outdone though, as just two days later, on July the 11th, 2021, a pristine copy of Super Mario 64 sold for the, frankly, outrageous sum of $1.5 million. Mario went on to break his own record again in August, when a copy of Super Mario Bros. sold for $2 million. Show off. Number 8. Ocarina of Time in first person? Yep, you heard that correctly, folks. For a short period during the development of Ocarina of Time, Shigeru Miyamoto toyed with the idea of making the game a first-person experience. The revelation came during a roundtable with the late, great Satoru Iwata, who shared that when he asked Miyamoto about how they should approach The Legend of Zelda on the N64, the latter suggested that Link wouldn't appear on screen at all. The theory behind the idea was that using a first-person view would allow players to take in the vast terrain of Hyrule in the best possible way. It would also have allowed the developers to use more of the Nintendo 64's processing power on creating enemies and more detailed environments. The reasoning all makes complete sense, but the thought of the audience not being able to see their beloved protagonist was just beyond the pale. Yoshiaki Koizumi, who was working on Link's model at the time, said that he couldn't stand to see my Link not appear. Aww. As we know, the idea was scrapped, mostly due to the fact that a first-person perspective made the game look kind of boring. Considering that Ocarina of Time is now thought of as one of the best games ever made, though, we'd say it was a good decision. Number 7. The City of Kyoto is the real-world Hyrule 
When you look at the Hyrule presented in 2017's The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, it's hard to believe that very much of it is grounded in reality, but when it came to designing the map, the development team drew a huge amount of inspiration from the city of Kyoto. In an interview with The Verge, Hidemaro Fujibayashi, director of Breath of the Wild, revealed that he grew up in Kyoto and had used his knowledge of the city to help plan out the game's map. He began with Link in an empty field, overlaid a map of Kyoto, and then used the city's landmarks to help plot points of interest in the game world. He said this helped in ensuring the right scale in the map, as he was able to equate the time travel between places in Kyoto to areas in the game. Coincidentally, Kyoto is also home to Nintendo's headquarters, so it was pretty handy when it came to communicating ideas between different teams. Rather than having long, protracted discussions about where this tower is and where that shrine should go, they were simply able to put it in terms of landmarks around Kyoto. Perhaps we could do something similar with Newcastle. We'll call it The Legend of Juxon, Garlic of the Chips. Yeah, that'll work. Number 6. The Influence of Twin Peaks When you think of games inspired by the early 90s mystery series Twin Peaks, then your mind probably goes to the likes of Deadly Premonition. Many titles have taken elements from the show, but the first to do so was arguably The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. If you've played the game, you'll know that the whole thing feels very surreal, and this all comes down to the fact that director Takashi Tezuka wanted the game to draw upon David Lynch's work. Just as development was beginning on Link's Awakening, Twin Peaks was being broadcast in Japan. The series was hugely popular, and Tezuka was keen for the game to have the same sort of small-town focus and a similar cast of oddball characters. Though he wanted the game to be small in scope and easy to understand, he also wanted there to be a level of complexity to it, and what resulted was a game that felt otherworldly and was populated by a motley crew of strange individuals. Tezuka was not the only fan of Twin Peaks at Nintendo, though, as Shigeru Miyamoto also drew inspiration for some of Ocarina of Time's characters from the show. Like Tezuka, he found the suspicious characters to be particularly interesting and ensured similar types were worked into his game as well. Number 5. The Inspiration for Link it's time for us to play a bit of a game now! Don't worry, it's nice and easy to understand. I'll describe a fictional character, and all you have to do is guess who it is. Are you ready? I'm thinking of a young man with pointy ears, a long green tunic, and a matching hat. Did you guess the Legend of Zelda protagonist, Link? Well, you'd be wrong, because I was actually describing Disney's Peter Pan. Did I fool you? Answers on a postcard were in the comments, I suppose. Indeed, when it came to designing a hero for the series, the team decided not to go for something completely new and radical, and instead opted for a design that people would recognize. With this in mind, director and sprite designer Takashi Tezuka looked to Disney for inspiration. The limitations of the Famicom meant that the team could only use three different colors, so taking into consideration the forest environments and the influence of Peter Pan, they settled on green as Link's signature color. Director Shigeru Miyamoto was keen to point out that the team didn't take too much from the beloved Disney character as, to quote from him directly, it wouldn't have been great. Considering just how lawyer-happy the House of Mouse can be, he was probably right. Number 4. Breath of the Wild has an 8-bit prototype when it launched in 2017, Breath of the Wild was the biggest Zelda game that players had ever had the good fortune to experience. Rome wasn't built in a day, though, and it was from a very tiny acorn that the massive oak of a game eventually sprouted. Director Hidemaro Fujibayashi wanted to create a game where the user can think and decide on their own where they want to go and what they want to do. In order to get a feel for how his ideas would translate into a Zelda game, he and Takahiro Dota, the game's technical director, set about creating a simple 2D prototype. In a short clip shown at the 2017 Game Developers Conference, a tiny, pixelated Link is seen fighting monsters, chopping down a tree to create a bridge, and setting fire to forests. Putting his ideas into this format allowed Fujibayashi to share his vision in a tangible way, and helped shape the game into the masterpiece it ended up as. Sadly, the prototype is just that, and doesn't really have anything in the way of structure or even solvable puzzles, but despite not being available to play, it was still an important foundation for one of the greatest games ever made. Number 3. The Legend of Zelda main theme was almost stock music. If I asked you to hum the main theme from The Legend of Zelda, assuming you're a fan, you probably could, right? I'm not going to do it, because I'm saving my voice for the Triple Jump Office production of Les Mis in which I'm playing Javert, but I encourage all of you to belt it out. As video game soundtracks go, the Legend of Zelda main theme is up there with the likes of Tetris and Super Mario Bros, but there was a point in the first game's development where there was no intention to write a new piece of music for the title. Initially, composer Koji Kondo wanted to use Maurice Ravel's Bolero for the game, however when it came to it, it turned out that the classical piece was still under copyright and therefore couldn't be used without incurring serious cost or a massive legal battle. With no other choice than to create something from scratch, Kondo got to work and wrote the piece that we all know and love. 
If you listen to the two tracks one after the other, it's clear where Kondo got his inspiration from, though if you ask me, his piece is far more iconic. Number 2. The Japanese and American versions of The Legend of Zelda are vastly different. It's quite easy to assume that the experience of a player in the US will be identical to that of a player in Japan, so it did come as a bit of a surprise to us that this was not the case for The Legend of Zelda. Of course, it makes sense considering how different the two nations are culturally, but it was still a shock to us nonetheless. We've already mentioned that the title of the game was changed, and naturally the language had to be localized. Minor tweaks were made to the stylization, but there were more noticeable differences between the Famicom and the NES versions than just what font was used. Probably the most notable change is one that confused a great number of American gamers back in the day. The game's manual tells players that the enemy, Pol's voice, hates noise, and so many spent ages trying to defeat him with the whistle. It turns out, however, that this was carried over from the Japanese edition of the game. You see, the Famicom controller had a small microphone built in so players could defeat Pol's voice by yelling at him. Unfortunately for American players, shouting at their NES didn't have quite the same effect. Number 1. The Origins of Link and Zelda Having been part of the lives of millions of gamers for over 30 years, it's almost impossible to imagine the main duo being called anything besides Link and Zelda, but have you ever wondered exactly what inspired their monikers? Well, wonder no more! When it comes to Zelda, Shigeru Miyamoto was inspired by Zelda Fitzgerald, an American novelist and socialite who is the wife of the great Gatsby author F. Scott Fitzgerald. A PR planner had suggested the name alongside an idea for an illustrated story, and though Miyamoto wasn't keen on the book, he found the name to be pleasant and significant, so it stuck. The name was so iconic, in fact, that Nintendo superfan Robin Williams even named his daughter after the titular princess, and they both appeared in adverts together, and it was amazing. Link's name, on the other hand, is a bit more literal. Originally, The Legend of Zelda was going to have more of a sci-fi theme, with the Triforce being made up of electronic chips, or garlic and chips, right? Can we... no? Anyone? Is that Nintendo? Anyway, the game was intended to span multiple time periods. Since the protagonist would have traveled between these, he was named Link. Get it? You know, because he's the link between them all. Miyamoto has also said that Link connects people together, so even with the series more fantasy setting, the name still has great significance. 